Today, we must say goodbye to Freerun Beyond Journey's End. This series has been nothing short of special. From the return of Madhouse to the absolute social media storm from fan art, articles, viewership, and just the absolute reach this series has had. So today, we say goodbye, but not forever, to one of anime's finest fantasy series in the modern age. So let's break down and analyze the final episode of Freerun Beyond Journey's End Season 1, Episode 28. But before that, I want to give a genuine thank you for your insane viewership, lovely and supportive comments, and feedback. Without you, this wouldn't be possible, and I appreciate all of it. So please, if you haven't, drop a like and subscribe. We'll be covering Demon Slayer and My Hero Academia in May, so let's get a little bit hyped for that. So after Fern passed the exam, in walks our favorite Denkin. Now, about this one, for about a month now on my podcast called King of Anime, we've been theorizing Denkin would pass and for a moment it felt like I got got because Dinkin comes in and Serie reveals that she knows all about him. He's an imperial mage, more specifically a veteran mage in the military who is now the most authoritative mage of the northern countries and it even has a quote glorious tale attached to him as well. We even get to see Denkin as a young lad, and <laughs> wow, is he way more handsome than he is now, but I think that's probably, you know, saying the obvious. But it's crazy he went from that to the Peanuts guy in 50 years. <laughs> but now here's the crazy part. Serie then tells him that she wishes to have met him when he was young and filled with vigor and ambition, but she has no interest in cinders. Or so she thought. It's interesting, right? Many people will often consider older men and women to not have any goals or desires because by that age, they're ready to tap out and just ride out the rest of their lives with what they have. Denkin is different because he still has a need to accomplish and the hunger of, well, youth still rages within him. And I like that about his character because it gives him a charm and makes him stand out. Yeah, it's a young person's game, but for Denkin, it seems he would care less what the age of his body is. His mind is still sharp and very ready. So he asks if Serie has changed her mind, but she retorts with a very interesting question. When you look at me, you wondered how you would fight me. Yes? As he goes on to say, it was only for a mere instance, but he quickly resigned that thought. However, Denkin still walked into that room knowing it was Serie and still thought about it. Insane, but this is where it clicked for me with Denkin too. With age, Denkin hasn't necessarily deteriorated, but he's more of like a fine wine after all of these years. The reason he thought about fighting her and discarding the thought was because his age and wisdom led to him uh, to, to believe it was hopeless. And this is an instant where age played very well for him, and because of it, he passes the exam and is now recognized as a first-class mage, just like he wanted. And it's mostly because he had the balls to think about fighting Serie when nobody else before him has. So in my opinion, Denkin is one of the standouts of Freerun overall, and I cannot wait to to see where his character goes in season two because he's just a terrific character with a ton of upside to him. Like, what's his next goal? Is he going to take Laufen under his tutelage in Richter 2? Now that he's cleared this major hurdle, what's next for the great Denkin? I doubt it's retirement. I'd surmise there is something more up his sleeve for sure, right? Next up, we got Yubel, the character that I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt would pass the instance that she was first introduced. And, and the reason is simple. When she was fighting Sense and described Ray Sidon, I knew that based on that description alone, she would pass. And I was right because Serie passes her. And honestly, I kind of loved the interaction between these two. Yubel is like, I haven't even said a word yet. But Serie is like, hey man, is there a need to talk as if we don't both know before any of this is going to happen that I would pass you. Yubel is like, I haven't even said a word yet. But Serie is like, hey man, there's no need to talk about something we already know is gonna happen, right? You got you, you passed. And Yubel is just like, fair point, and leaves. This is another one like Denkin, where this character took us by a, uh, by storm, really, but really in a different way. Yubel just reeks that cool factor. I mean, she wears all black for Christ's sakes. That just makes her immediately cool, apparently, and cuts people with the edge of her insanely powerful technique and well edge. Then on top of that, the internet, oh, oh God, just took her and ran with it. Do you know how much fan art I've seen of Yubel cutting Sense's hair? Not enough, but a lot. I have zero clue where her character is headed for season two, but I, I am so intrigued, especially with what happens later in this episode. However, her character this season didn't, well, exist 
beyond her badassery, sex appeal, and craziness. And that's in no way a condemnation, by the way. She's one of my favorites. But what I am saying is that we've not even broken the surface of Yubel. Season two, hopefully, will do that. And I, I really, I probably guarantee you it'll do that, and it'll be glorious. This is when we got to Land's exam, and I was shocked. I originally pinned this guy as someone else entirely, but I always felt he was special and had something others didn't. Something about him just keeping cool all of the time as if nothing mattered. I, I don't know. It was sussy, but sussy in a, I think, a good way? And I was right about my assumptions, because Serrier immediately tells him to stop joking around and goes on to explain that he's not even here right now. He's using magic to be completely at a different place at home sipping tea. So for from the very beginning, Land hadn't even stepped a single foot into the exam. Not even Yubel could tell it was a fake Land. That right there impresses Serie, and so he gets a pass. And I mean, what can you really say other than impressive, right? I never thought for a second Land was using a technique like this, but now that it has been revealed he was, I, I wonder what else he can do beyond that. This opens up even more avenues for his character because of how perceived his new strengths are. I mean, this is big for him. Next up, we get to the edgy boy, Werble. It's pretty impressive because he almost cut Serie with his edge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, joking aside. Serie also knows about him as the captain of the Northern Magic Corps, and he is known as the greatest combatant among all of the second class mages. And for that reason, he realizes at only a glance that Serie was pretty much unbeatable. But here's the kick. He didn't make that judgment out of fear. In Werbel's own words, he says that only a second class mage would be foolish enough to fight an unwittable match. And this shows to me that Werbel, much like Denkin, knows at a young age to not mess with Serie. This is impressive, but I have noticed that those who flatter Serie also have a higher chance of passing, even if it's unintentional flattery. But she asks his favorite magic, and he says that the magic is only a tool for used for killing, and even suggests that there is no liking or hating magic because of that. So she passes him. And I'd think that Serie passed him because of the way he answered that question, because it shows a level of clarity with Werbel. He's not caught up on the morals of magic use. He he really just simply views it as a tool, and while yes, he said it's used for killing, which is both wrong and kind of psychotic, his answer does show he is realistic about the use of magic. However, this is when we get to Method, who has one of my favorite scenes in this episode, and it's like non-existent, almost. That's how short it is. Serie asks what she thinks of her when <laughs> looking at her, so she gives it a moment's thought and says, well... Isn't she the cutest little thing? <laughs> I've got to say it. Method is one of the low-key, awesomest characters. She's so funny, yet at the same time is powerful and wise beyond her blank, mature demeanor. It's just sad, you know, that Sign missed out on his literal type, a tall, older woman. But Serie is like, what's going on with these examinees this year? Pass. All I can say is two things. Deserved and marry me, Method. After the exam, Serie apologizes to Sense as this year, according to her, was an abundant harvest. But while this is yet another example of Serie's intuition at play, what's more interesting to me is what they show afterward. We see Werbel, who is comforting his failed group as they look <laughs> mega depressed. Lan tells Ubel, Ubel, Rubel, Rubel Dubel, uh, to stop following him, which I guarantee you a bunch of Twitter simps are now angry at him. How could you walk away from Ubel? I can hear it now. And Kane is just, well, you, you know, it's Kane. But what I thought was funny is Fern tells Freerin she passed, and Freerin gives her a pat on the head and tells her she's a good girl. Seriously, if you guys think about their relationship for a moment, <laughs> It's pretty strange. Freerin and Fern are basically both mother and daughter to each other. Freerin is always there when Fern is sick or accomplishes something great, while Fern is always there to Freerin to, you know, bail her out of trouble or Method's boobs. They're both very protective over each other, like mothers in that sense. And when you think about it, these are just, they're just so unique together and are unlike any characters or groups in the series as of this moment. As well, afterward, Denkin goes to thank Freerin for allowing him to reach this far, and now it is time to go back to his hometown to visit the cemetery. And there is a twinge of sadness to that, in that he doesn't mention anyone else like Lafon or Richter or some family. No, he says cemetery. That's what he'll do to celebrate instead of with someone, and I imagine that cemetery and the people it holds within it are the reason Denkin has that intense fire burning yet, which is confirmed later in this episode. When it comes to these exams, though, I felt like this was the best way to go. 
I learned a lot more about a lot of these characters than I think I would have if it was just a regular test. Plus, it's a great way to continue the story of these characters in the future too, which I want to see, of course. As well, what are the ramifications of those that have passed? Werbel and Yubel seem less than morally good people, so will this new classification allow them to get to places that would compromise our main character's journey? As well, what of characters like Denkin and Methode? These two characters are interesting in the sense that they're both very similar with them being quiet, wise, and powerful, but I, I can't imagine them not being a huge factor in the future of this series. I mean, they're too good to ignore, especially their character designs. So if I were to guess, I'd say Yubel and Werbel will fit more into an antagonistic-like role, but more like anti-heroes. That is, or so I thought. And Denkin and Method will continue to be fixtures of the secondary cast that will play major roles in the main plot by being vehicles to move it forward when necessary. But it's a time for celebration and eating and for Fern to decide, and it'll be any day now, any day now. Stark is wondering why she's taking so long, but when she finally decides on her pick, a new enemy arrives in the form of the Donut Demon, Lawfen. The meeting of these two worthy foes will be sure to split the world in two with their might and power. Will Fern's pout be able to withstand the indomitable hunger and ferocity of Lawfen's sweet tooth? Will Stark or Dinkin survive as witness to this great showdown? And will Vegeta's 50 episodes of training pay off? Probably not. Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. Uh, okay, so after the showdown, they all sit down to eat together, and Dinkin, being the old man he is, tells them to not mind him and just eat because as a kid, he never got to eat sweet things, which is another aspect of Dinkin we're slowly piecing together here. Seems based on him not being able to eat sweets that he grew up not being able to eat them because of his royal upbringing, which usually, you, you know, you'd think as a noble, you'd be able to partake in the riches of that world. So I do think something is there uh, more in his past, but it's cool that one sentence like that can open up a whole new set of questions about Dinkin's past. Upon being told who this is, Stark freaks the freak out as he realizes he's potentially a noble, but then we get into Dinkin's backstory from this, which was just, oh my god, it was so good. He goes on to tell them that he had no children or grandchildren and his wife died when he was still in his mid-twenties. Turns out that when it came to his wife, her body was very frail and she was the daughter of a noble from a remote region in the plateau that had been going through a lot of political turmoil. And at the time, he needed both wealth and influence. And because of all of this, this was the only way he knew to save her. So when Serrier established the Continental Magic Association, his wife had passed away shortly thereafter and he had never in his life felt so helpless. I mean, how could you not? To him, he finds irony in that now he can command a country. And so he tells Fern that to him, magic was only ever a tool for conflict. But he says something hopeful here. To tell Freerin that for the first time in a long time, he finally felt happiness using magic and that it can be fun. Here is what's crazier though. He became a mage in the first place because of Freerin's hero party. So I think this is one of the rare instances that someone finally remembers Freerin from all of those years ago. We spent most of the series with a lot of people not knowing who Freerin is because so much time has passed that people have forgotten, passed away, or just don't know. It's a sobering reality that eventually, and it won't take very long, but uh, you will be forgotten in time. But there is still the chance someone yet will speak your name again. While this is happening, we cut to Freerin who is enjoying her new grimoire when Werbel comes by and helps an old lady with her apples. He then sits next to the embodiment of Elf and begins to sort of antagonize Freerin a little bit about being in Himmel's party, but she quickly turns it around and mentions that he tried to kill Fern and her team and that Werbel looked like someone who'd kick a dog, which to be fair is true. He does look like he'd kick a dog, but I thought for sure he'd kick the old lady too, to be fair. This guy, he even says it's not like he can say he hasn't heard something like that before, suggesting that he's maybe a bit of a dick. Despite that, he says something most interesting and alludes to Yubel being someone who is better off dead and that the world would be better off for it. To which I say, I, I agree. But sadly, as evident by this Twitter post, I'm afraid it will go on deaf ears. Exhibit A. I could fix her. Yeah? Well, 
I could accept her as she is. You don't like murder? Grow up. The atrocities are a part of her, and I decided they're funny. But we do get a bit of clarity to Werbel as a person. He says that he would do anything to protect his village, and his reason for becoming a first-class mage was to earn that special privilege and be granted the magic that he desires. Because the way he views it, and the more powerful magic that he has, the more demons he'll destroy. Interestingly, he even says that if there is someone who needs help, no matter the relevance or lack thereof, he'd help. As I stated earlier, I pegged Werble as someone more in line with Yubel, but the truth couldn't be actually further from it. He sees Yubel as a threat to the entire world as is, and I, I mean, honestly, I, even then, I never considered her to be that big of a threat, but hearing Werble's words makes me very suspicious of what Yubel intends to do. Also, the fact that Werble is in reality someone with a very gracious and caring heart is uh, admittedly a little surprising. Considering the way he dresses and carries himself and his ideals on magic initially, but I, I think I misunderstood him. In reality, his thoughts on magic are even more neutral than I thought. He truly only seeks power so that he may use it as a tool to protect. Wild stuff, man. Very wild. This is also when we learn that his hometown is in a remote region to the north and that growing up, there are a lot of anecdotes about Hero Himmel. The conquering of the Thousand Mirror Tower, immortal bows, and one of the seven sages of destruction, and uh, get this, awesome name, Hell Emperor Dragon as a kid. Werbel loved reading stories about those kinds of adventures, however, the elderly in the village had stories of that nature to share too. And all I have to say about this is that this series may be primed for so many more adventures of and avenues of storytelling than I thought. We could seriously have an entire series in film based on things Werbel said here. Imagine a movie where the hero party fights the Hell Emperor Dragon. Oh my god, sign me up, that would be badass, man. But growing up, loving these stories when he was told of the things the hero party did, he thought they were bland, and yet everyone in the village spoke of them with reverence. Clearly, this was youth at play, because when you're a kid, you think being a hero is like slaying dragons or saving the world, you know, stuff like that. But in reality, being a hero is simply doing what needs to be done to help people in a rough situation, even if Himmel's toughest job was transporting goods for the village. That's still heroic to do, and he is a hero to, to those people still, because without that selfless work, you know, maybe the village would be no more. But he finally realizes that when Himmel died, what was left of the demons came, you know, with a vengeance. We see the untold destruction of what they did to the village, and oh my god, oh my god, Madhouse does a flashback so good in this series. But he tells Freerun that he is sure without Himmel that the village would no longer have existed well after the world became peaceful. And what Werbel wanted to tell Freerun is that these stories of adventure brought him this far. And really, you know, it's an interesting thought, but Freerun, when you think about it, is the last symbol of the hero party, and it feels like she's one of the last great heroes to honestly ever exist, and that people are coming up to her to pay their respects for all that, you know, they did for them. And it almost feels like her time has passed, and it's now up to this new generation of humans to carry forward the torch of the hero party. But as Werbel's party shows up, he parts with words to Freerun to treasure the people that he meets. His final farewells aren't always because of death, but of course he figures at the same time she probably already knows about that. But like always, this sends her into a flashback where she remembers Himmel being asked why they're doing such trivial things as helping village people while they need to kill the Demon King. And he realizes that this gesture is trivial and likely won't have an impact on the world, which I disagree, as Werbel shows us clearly, but he has no intention of forsaking people who need help help or is in trouble. And with that memory, Freerun says to Himmel in the present that it'll be fine because the world is genuinely changing. As before her, Werbel is carrying on that small gesture Himmel did for that village all of those years ago. Himmel didn't realize it, but he was a part of Werbel's life and helped set him on a good path and in turn will help others be set on a good path. Later that night, at the ill-fated name of the Swallow Inn, they discuss the next step after the exam, which is when Serrier will grant them their privileges, and they're each allowed to bring guests. That is, except for Free Red, because she's banned for a thousand years from attending. It sucks to be her, and the face Free Red makes is beyond hilarious. Classic Free Red face. I, I absolutely love this. If they sold a poster of her just doing that expression, I'd buy 12. But I love how she calls Serie a child. <laughs> it's not like I wanted to go anyways, just totally denying it like a Sundere. It was cute, and even Fern gives a smirk to it. However, later that night, as they're still waiting for Fern to finish up, we get some really interesting lore, as Freerun says that there are fewer than 50 first-class mages that exist, which means 
Fern is now put into a very elite class of mages. She then holds up a necklace and says something most interesting, that Fern will probably become a more famous mage than her. That's incredible to think about considering that she was a part of the hero party, but either way, good for Fern. Now, this is when Lernan shows up and attacks Freerin after apologizing for Serie's behavior towards her. But right before the attack, Freerin says the most interesting thing, which seems to be a, a whole trend with this episode. She senses that Lernan can read her mana fluctuation, and we learn that if this were a different era, he would be a very famous mage that would go down in history, rivaling that of the hero party. However, he's a mage that only knows battle, and so he basically wants to be the one to kill Freerun to go down in history, so that Serie will remember him, and he even injures her shoulder too. But what's important here is that it seems that as if Freerun isn't even really mad about it or even worried, but he requests a duel that she turns down ultimately as there is no point, because Serie will remember him which is touching as we go into a sort of flashback here, which leads into a really illuminating moment for Serie's character, where Freerin, just before leaving the exam room, asks Serie about the flowers that she's taken care of, all conjured by magic. Which is a little strange if you think about it, as Serie chastised Freerin over her favorite spell, which is conjuring flowers. So rightfully, she calls it out. Serie has an interesting answer though. She says Flamme was a failure. Despite her talent, she failed to reach her heights. And most of her students really didn't or weren't able to as well. But even so, she never once forgot all of their favorite spells and never once did she forget them. So even though she was cold to learn it and called him a failure too, in reality, Serie will remember and does care. She just doesn't really share what she's thinking or her feelings really towards anyone. She keeps it all on the inside, which Freerun calls her a child for, but you know, Freerun does sort of similar things, even though she is much more expressive in how she feels and communicates to other people. But you know, that's a whole other thing. But the test is done and Fern is now out with her new privilege. We also get this cute little scene where everyone basically loves Stark. Seriously, it's, it's almost frightening how much they do, but you know, he deserves it. He's such a good boy, especially dealing with Fern pouting all the time. But they must embark on their next journey and leave Alburst behind, and we learn a Fern spell that she chose. She twirls around and Freerin inspects Fern, realizing she chose the spell to clean clothes as her privilege, which is apparently a legendary level spell long ago. But Freerin is proud of her, and as she pats her head, Fern beams with radiance and gives a smile back to Freerin, which is just so cute. But what I found was hilarious was when we saw Serie's reaction, which was a little less than ecstatic, lol. And on their way out of Alburst, they come upon the greatest ship in anime history, Kane, and her bestest half, Lawine. They basically see him off and tell her that they'll be taking the test again in three years. So that was a, it was a nice little, little thing there to have those two show up at the end of the episode. I almost thought they wouldn't. But we do get into a great final scene for this season as Fern asks, why the quick goodbyes? And just like always, exactly how the show began, it ends with a flashback to Himmel being asked the same question and giving a simple answer. It wouldn't be embarrassing when we meet again. Man, what an emotionally breathtaking way to end this series as the ending plays out. Like always, except this time we see all of our characters throughout the series living their happy lives just like always, enjoying what they have together. The series ends with Freerun simply repeating the words of Himmel as it fades to black and we get an interesting final message. The journey to end continues, confirming that yes, Madhouse will be returning for a second season of Freerun Beyond Journey's End. This was the perfect finale for Freerun season one, and I cannot wait for what they're cooking up for season two of this series. Everything about this show was just so good from top to bottom. Animation, art, characters, writing, story, it was all so freaking good. I think even with all of the hype surrounding this series currently, we are looking at one of the best new anime for this generation of anime viewers. And for it to be from the legendary Madhouse, which people thought for a very long time they were done as a studio, and to come back and put this out? Well, to say the least, I think Madhouse's future is looking bright and I can't wait for what they produce next. 
being said, if you're a little lost on Freerun's ending, don't worry. I just put out a video explaining in detail the ending to Freerun Beyond Journey's End Season 1, just like I did with Attack on Titan's ending. So please head on over and check that out right after you help me out, because in May, we'll be covering My Hero Academia Season 7 and Demon Slayer Season 4. So if you want to watch me talk about those series, then subscribe to the channel and as well drop a like on this video and comment on your favorite moment from Freerun Season 1 overall. I'd love to hear what you guys come up with. If you want, financially support the channel by becoming a patron, buying some merch, or checking out my other content on AOT, Demon Slayer, or Freerun. Every bit helps. Thanks for watching. Bye bye